Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, thank you for that great introduction um, as well. Uh, and it's funny you mentioned the, the, the title thing changing every five minutes. It's true. And uh, my title is currently uh, in flux because my supervisor, Michelle, just left. So who, I'm currently the Eco Literacy and Restoration Specialist, but yeah, all that could change. Um, I'm going to start. Let me see. Uh, nope. Got to do it the other way. I got to share screen first and then go to full screen. All right. So let's do that. All right. Uh, can everybody see uh, the, fir nope, the first slide here? History of our most precious resource? Yes. OK, great. Uh, yes, so let's get started. Yes, my name is John Mara. Uh, as Ronwin said, Eagle Literacy and Restoration Specialist. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what I do uh, at Blue Water and what Blue Water is um, before we get into talking about um, what the title implies, History of Our Most Precious Resource, uh, Water. All right, so first thing we're going to do is uh, we are going to all right, so it is on a bit of autoplay. That is a pain in the butt. Okay. Um, first, we're going to talk about who is Blue Water Baltimore um, and what do we do and who am I. Uh, then we'll go, I'll uh, going to define a few terms for you that will help us orient us in time and space. Uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Um, then we'll get into a little bit about the natural history of water. That'll be like the bulk the real, the real uh, meat and potatoes of this presentation, so to speak, um, along with Baltimore's urban water cycle. Uh, then we'll get into the various solutions uh, and opportunities to um, work on these different issues that I'll be bringing up. And uh, then we'll wrap up with a Q&A uh, at the end there. Um, I must admit though, I'm more of an educator than a scientist by trade, so I, but I will do my best to answer uh, your questions as best as I can. Um, so wow, oh, it is on it is on autoplay. This is gonna this is gonna be fun. Um, I got to figure out how to make it not do that. Uh, let me see here. Do you have to? Can I, can I just make you go to full screen and not do a slideshow? Let's stop. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I so I, I apologize, everybody. Um, let's hopefully hopefully it will. Uh, cooperate now. So it was Blue Water Baltimore. This is our mission statement here. Uh, we are a nonprofit here in Baltimore that works primarily in the city and the county uh, to help improve the rivers and streams and uh, the quality of life in the harbor. Um, we are part of the International Waterkeeper Alliance. And basically, we are your local environmental organization focused on cleaning up the waterways of Baltimore City and County. We do a lot of stuff that uh, is beneficial for the environment in general. But all with the mission of keeping the waterways uh, clean as best we can. Uh, we have about 25 different staff members with expertise in environmental and sustainable educa sustainability education, uh, public policy, water quality uh, analytics and analysis with that's again, the water keepers. Uh, we do a lot of volunteer events, so a lot of volunteer managing, uh, community organizing, and we even have a native plant nursery. You might've heard of the uh, Herring Run Nursery. That is um, our nursery run by our organization. Uh, and I encourage you to go visit it. Um, so these are all different ways that we work on keeping um, the waterways clean and clear. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, we do that by looking for what we call upstream solutions to downstream problems. Uh, in this image here, the downstream solutions are at the top of the image and the up, the, or the downstream problems, I should say, are at the top of the image. The upstream solutions are more in the middle there. Um, so, so these are all the different things that are affecting our waterways negatively up the top there, right? Stormwater runoff, sewage, pollutants, um, trash. Uh, we aim for upstream solutions. So for example, uh, trash in the waterways. An upstream solution for something like that is Mr. Trash Wheel. Uh, it's a little, little bit further, that's a, good, that's a good downstream solution to that problem. But uh, we love Mr. Trash Wheel, but he's collecting trash that really shouldn't be there in the first place. So a, a solution further upstream than that would be hosting a cleanup. A solution further upstream than that would be uh, talking to folks about single-use plastics, about single-use items for anything, about disposing of them properly, about recycling. Further upstream than that is putting in policy um, so that those that kind of packaging isn't isn't allowed. Single-use things aren't allowed, or like you know, further and further up. You can scale it all the way up like that. Um, so you know, like I said. In a perfect world, Mr. Trash Wheel wouldn't exist. 
uh, because the trash that's there shouldn't be there in the first place. So this is kind of how we approach a lot of the different issues um, at, that we deal with the blue water. So that's what blue water does. You know, and we have, like I said, we do a myriad of different, uh, different things. We do storm drain uh, adoption. We do tree plantings. We you know, have rain barrels and encourage people to install rain gardens. Um, so that's what blue water does. Um, and since we live in an increasingly uh, digital and impersonal world, especially in the last few years, uh, here's a slide about me and about what I'm doing whenever I'm not at Blue Water Baltimore. Um, whenever I, when I am at Blue Water Baltimore, if I'm not doing the type of work we're talking about today, like planting trees, uh, I'm teaching people how to plant trees or, you know, I'm working sort of straddling the education and the uh, conservation project world. Uh, and I'm also an, a musician in the Baltimore music scene. And I, as Brian will mention, I do some work in theater. I've also done a few murals around town seen here with my fiance working on one of those murals. And uh, just because one of them may cross <clears throat> in front of the screen at some point as they are wont to do when I'm sitting at my laptop, I have two cats, uh, Mika and Tor. And they have been great additions to my, my family here during the pandemic. Like I said, though, we, one of them may visit. All right. So now you're oriented with me, a little bit more personal. Uh, let's get oriented here in time and space with some terms that may or may not be used to you, um, specifically uh, watershed and Anthropocene. Um, in the chat, uh, because I can't quite see it. Let me see here. Can you, oh, I, I, I did not realize that there were people putting, uh, thank you for commiserating with the slides. For, I've been doing this for two, we've been doing this stuff for two years. You think that the digital world would be much easier by now, but it's still confusing. All right, so in the chat, put what you think the answer to the question is. What is a watershed? And for bonus points, are you in one right now? Well, thank you a lot, Elvia. Don't be, shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah. Maureen, fine. Have you been to one of these before? Uh, Maureen and Elvia nailed it. Uh, a watershed, as you said, is a entire land area that drains to a common body of water. Um, usually that area is defined by high points of elevation to low points of elevation because that's how water flows, thanks to gravity. Um, <clears throat> and yes, we are yes, we are all in Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, oh, and the Patuxent, very cool. You're uh, you're a bit you're a bit away from here, but that's that's great. Um, so for those of you who don't know, yeah, this is this is a great way to think about it. Um, think of a double basin sink. Uh, a watershed, you know, like when it rains, the wa the water comes out from the sky. Rain comes down from the sky, it lands on the earth, and it flows to our different local bodies of water, whether it flows to a stream or to a river or or lands in a lake. Um, so a good way to think about that, water coming out of the spigot of the sink, filling up one party, one space in the sink, when it flows into the other, that's water moving from one watershed to another watershed. So moving from a, a, like a stream to a larger body of water. And then that whole uh, double basin sink itself is, you could consider one larger water, one watershed. And then if you were to plug up the sink and let it fill up your whole, your whole house, your kitchen is a watershed, your first floor is a watershed. Um, so you can think of it sort of like, if that's not a great, if you don't like thinking of flooding your home, you can think of it like your block, your neighborhood, your, your town, city, state, it all scales up. Um, <clears throat> so for example, here are the watersheds that straddle Baltimore city. Uh, there's four main ones um, starting at, the, t starting at uh, the top, or actually let's start yeah, on, the, on the left there, Gwynn's Falls, Jones Falls, the Herring Run Back River, and then the Harbor Watershed with a little bit of the main branch of the Tapsco there at the bottom. Um, so the, those four and like a little bit of the fifth one uh, are the main watersheds here in Baltimore City. Uh, and, but those watersheds are you know vast and you can see they cover a lot more than just Baltimore City and have a lot more residents in them. Actually that number should be closer to 2 million residents now um, because as, uh, as we expand, so does our footprint. Um, these water, yeah, as I said, the watersheds encompass 194 square miles, 454 river miles, and about 2 million residents. Uh, and they are all part of a larger watershed network, the Chesapeake, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Network, which as you can see uh, is six states and the District of Columbia, goes as far north as New York, 
um, all the way out to the Eastern shore and as far west as West Virginia and Western Virginia. Uh, it's a huge watershed and, and that's again from high points of elevation to low points that's all draining down to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so we're catching a fair bit of, a, of, a, of, a, of the brunt of, of stormwater runoff down here. All right, so that's a watershed. Now, the Anthropocene, uh, this is, we defined where we were in space with the watersheds, now we'll define where we are in time. Um, Earth scientists use the geological timeline to timestamp the events that have occurred on Earth since its inception about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, on the timeline, time is divided into subcategories that correspond with large uh, Earth shaping events. Uh, eons being the longest and epochs being the shortest. Um, but by the shortest, that's uh, the shortest time, like epoch is about a million years. So short is relative here, just like time is relative. Uh, so for example, dinosaurs were about, where, come on, click. Dinosaurs were about a hundred million years ago in the, uh, the Mesozoic era. That was supposed to be, was supposed to be a pointer up there. I guess that one missed. Uh, but the Anthropocene, where we are currently, is the proposed current epoch we are living in. It is not formally a uh, defined geological unit of time. Uh, we were formally in the Holocene, which started 12,000 years ago and encompasses the dawn of early civilization. Um, again, I'm an educator, not a scientist, so I'm not going to get too nitty gritty about this. Um, but basically, consider the Anthropocene the current time period that we're in right now as the time that humans began to alter the, the ecosystems of Earth on a massive scale. Uh, this is usually said to have begun about 250 years ago, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Um, but there's an argument to be made. It could be the, like, as soon as we began to learn how to, uh, how to uh, farm and make crops and, and like intentionally grow things in certain places that do not grow naturally in rows. Uh, so it's just basically since the time that we've been able to move Earth for our own purposes. Um, so that's where we are in space and in time. So now that we're oriented in that way, I'm going to walk you through the natural history of water. And we'll get up to the point where we, uh, well, we'll get up to the point in the present. We'll start with, we, start, we did the history of humans a little bit. Now we'll do the history of water and we'll come to where they both meet. Uh, I'm going to walk you through the natural history of water and share some ideas of where it originated, how it got to Earth. Um, and just trying to, again, just trying to give you a broad uh, understanding of this topic. But I encourage you to go on to Wikipedia, uh, where I found a good number of these resources vetted. And uh, let's see. OK, so begin at the beginning. And I mean the beginning. Uh, when I Google the origin story, that's what came up. I don't know what that says about our culture, but I'm not going to try to make any bold statements about that today. I'm just going to leave you to ponder that. Uh, but after sorting through a few hundred images, did find this one. The Big Bang, the actual Big Bang, was about 14 billion years ago. Uh, within seconds, the first simple elements formed, hydrogen, helium, lithium, uh, under which great pressure and fusion formed the first stars. Uh, 200 million years later. The elements of life, oxygen and carbon, came about during the explosions of the first massive stars about 400 million years later. Uh, fairly imminently, oxygen fused with hydrogen and water was born. Our solar system was born about 9 billion years after that, making our tiny corner of the universe about 5 billion years old. Uh, there are a lot of theories about how water made its way to Earth. Uh, for decades, the prevailing one has been that water-bearing comets struck the surface of our dry planet, creating oceans. Um, another new theory from 2016 suggests cosmic water was a central ingredient to the formation of our solar system and Earth formed covered in water. Um, there's some uh, pretty interesting theories about, about that. If do you want to do a fun Google search about um, what the Earth might have been like if it, was, if it was indeed a water world when it formed. But... The real answer is we just don't know. And we have a lot of theories and we have a lot of guesses, uh, a lot of educated guesses, but we just don't know for sure. Um, the Big Bang is our culture's scientifically informed origin story, but 
there are many cultures on this that also talk about how water ended up on Earth. Uh, according to the Iroquois Nation um, of Native Americans, water was already on the Earth, much like the new 2016 theory of the water world Earth. Uh, in in this uh, in this <clears throat> excuse me in this cultural myth, though, a sky woman fell from her home. The sea animals caught her and dove to the bottom of the sea to bring up mud. They spread the mud onto the back of the big turtle, and once there, it began to grow until it became the North American continent, uh, which is just as plausible, really, when you think about something like this. Uh, but let's face it, either every origin story is quite strange and seemingly implausible and has vast implications. Um, one, of, uh, one of America's greatest, co America's greatest cosmologist, Carl, Carl Sagan, once said, the nitrogen in our DNA the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff, uh, which is a pretty cool thing to think about that you share all the elements in your body, you share them with all the elements in the universe. Um, but for perspective, there's a lot of stuff that shares things with all the elements in the universe. You know, Just again, as we as humans need to remember our position in the universe, even though we are capable of shaping the planet around us. Despite how it got here, um, the fact is our planet is covered with clean primordial water and that is what has allowed us and all of life on earth to live here. Uh, now that we have some ideas and notions of how uh, water came to earth, I'm gonna share a few slides that discuss how it moves through the earth, uh, which is gonna bring you back to some of your earlier uh, earth science classes, um, but bear with me, you'll think you'll, this. This may be stuff you know, but you'll thank me for it later. All right, so this is the very basic image that shows the natural water cycle. We've all seen it um, in school or in a natural history museum, very idyllic landscape that has every type of landscape in there. There's forests right next to mountains, right next to lakes. Uh, and you, there's just completely unadulterated weather happening all the time. Um, and that's great. Basically water evaporates from Earth's surface, travels into the air as a gas, condenses on dust particles in the sky to form clouds, and then falls to Earth as either rain or snow, then evaporates again. Um, water changes from a solid to a liquid to a gas in this never ending cycle that is far more chaotic uh, than this graphic illustrates. Um, especially when you consider adding a city and humans into the mix where you, instead of, instead of mountains, you have buildings and instead of rivers, you have pipes. Uh, there are a lot of different disagreements as to how water got here, we know, uh, but we are confident that the water that is here on Earth has been here on Earth cycling in this, in this cycle for millions of years. Uh, with your every interaction with it, try to remain aware that water is cosmic and ancient, and you're drinking the same water that the dinosaurs drank, and that is weird. Pause to drink water myself because I'm getting parched. All right, and that's weird because water is weird. And that's not the only weird thing about water. Water is the only substance on earth that exists in the temperate zones of this planet as solid, liquid, and gas simultaneously. Think about that. It's the only element that can exist as all three things in one space. You know, and you have a glass of water with ice in it that's surrounded by air. All three, all three elements of water are right there, um, or states of water, I should say. Water can also defy gravity through capillary action. That's how trees remain hydrated. Uh, the, um, it can uh, make snowflakes, which are weird mathematical fractal objects, no two of which are alike. Um, and surface tension, the property that allows water to resist an external force, which is how you can have, but like certain creatures can ride upon it versus sinking into it. Uh, water is a magical substance that can do all of these different things. And of course, we ourselves are made of water. At least about 70, about two thirds of us are made of water. Um, bodies of animals also, uh, most animals are also sim similar. Plants, and, plants are mostly water. They're about 90 to 95% water, depending on the plant. Uh, and this is why dehydration makes you feel bad. You know, for whatever reason you're, you're dehydrated, you feel bad because you are literally missing part of yourself when you are dehydrated. Think about that. Uh, so. If you are water and water is weird, then mathematically you are weird. And isn't that nice to uh, 
to just sit with, to, to know that intrinsically you are weird and that nobody can, can, we can tell you otherwise. <laughs> um, case in point, uh, every winter, my colleagues will jump into the freezing Patapsco River to help raise money for BWB, Blue Water Baltimore, I should say. Uh, this year, the plan was to do it at the gunpowder, but with COVID still out there, I don't know what the plan is. I think we're considering using pools and or bathtubs, uh, which only further proves my point that you are weird and you are also water. Um, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get back to doing this again, at which point I will ask you to consider uh, sponsoring me to tell them to stop <laughs> because I've never done it and I don't want to, it's very cold. <laughs> All right, uh, so now that we have some ideas uh, as to where water came from and our relationship with it uh, and its weird properties, let's share some of its um, relationship through history. Our, our relationship through history. Uh, spoiler alert, it's complicated. So uh, our ancestors, humans' ancestors have been around for uh, about 6 million years, but the modern hu human as we consider ourselves only about two, 200,000 years. Uh, we started out in clans of hunters and gatherers that often followed bodies of water, especially dr uh, drinkable potable water. Living near water was essential to our survival. Um, as you know, or as you may not know, Humans can live up to three weeks without food, but only three days uh, to a week at most without water. And the week is, that's, pu that's pushing it. Um, naturally, the first stationary human settlements cropped up near water. And it was around this time that we began managing the water through irrigation practices. And again, this is, this is the Anthropocene. This is when we began to, rather, like, rather than following, following the river, looking for sources of food, we plopped down and we said, no, we're gonna make the river work for us instead. Uh, this, this is us beginning to shape the earth to our needs. Um, as we then further uh, complexified our culture, so did we complexify our water harvesting system. Uh, this is an example of the ancient Roman aqueduct. Uh, the Romans water system most closely resembles our modern one. Uh, though we enclosed it and added treatment plants and pressurization in order to not have to send everything downhill. If you look at the image, that's pretty much the only difference. One's using gravity, the other one's using a pump. Uh, throughout history, we took, the comp we took the common sense practicing of harvesting our water upstream and sending our waste poop and poop downstream, which makes sense. You know, you're gonna get the clean water upstream, put the dirty stuff downstream. However, <laughs> pooping has always been a problem for us, uh, especially when we started crowding into cities and keeping poop separate from our water supply is just one of the problems built that's built in with it. Aside from disposing it in streams during the Middle Ages, uh, chamber pots were also used, which were dumped into open sewers and cesspools. Um, and later, night soil collection was common, where nightmen collected our poop and hauled it out of the city to compost. It happened in Baltimore. It happened uh, in at New York, where I'm originally from. Most every major city had nightmen who carried night soil away. Uh, and as you can imagine, all this interaction with, with poop caused a lot of problems. Uh, and eventually, this guy, no, I'm just kidding. This guy, uh, of Sir Thomas Crapper of London, uh, refined the way that we interact with our own poop. He made the flush toilet in 1861, making it similar to what we use today. Uh, the flush toilet was invented a couple of centuries beforehand. This is a fun fact, the, but this was the first one that was like widely and commercially available to most folks. Uh, prior to that, it was kind of a luxury to have something that would flush poop away from your home. And there was a private plumbing system that did so. Um, the widespread use of flush toilets began to place a heavy demand on rapidly urbanizing environments and our flush, freshly budding uh, shared water systems, which at the time were made of hollowed out logs. Uh, this, is, this is, again, I'm gonna like bring it up the New York thing. When I was in high school, they were redoing some of the subways and I got to see on display uh, a, a section of hollowed out log that they had excavated out from underneath Manhattan. This was how a lot of East Coast cities sent water from one spot to another because when, when, the, when the colonists arrived, there was forest everywhere. So we leveled everything and used wood for whatever we could, including the pipes. You bevel, you bevel one end, you fit it into the, the other end of another log and you just line them up downhill. So you make use of gravity. Uh, pretty, pretty ingenuitive and pretty cool. And uh, like I said, these would, these were in the ground for hundreds of years. Um, and then, okay, Take, pausing to drink water. So 
that's a few examples of how humans use water over history. Um, and I promise this is all, this is all gonna tie in together uh, when, we get, when we get to the end. But now I'm gonna stop talking about humans for a minute. I'm gonna talk about these guys, beavers. Beavers are nature's hydrologists. And uh, other than humans, there is probably no other mammal that does more to shape and change the landscape to suit their needs than beavers. Um, we've, before we started doing it and you know, planted the flag of the Anthropocene, beavers were doing it for a much longer time. I mean, look how cute they are. Uh, much, much longer time than we've been doing it. The giant beaver went extinct about 10,000 years ago, but as, and as you can see, it was over eight feet long. Uh, but it did the same thing that our current smaller North American beavers uh, do today. Um, just side note, uh, there's no evidence that early humans hunted the giant beavers, um, but there's, no, there's not a lot of evidence that they didn't. Um, so, ah, come on, there we go. So yeah, big or small, the beavers did what beavers do. They built dams uh, and the dams come, with dams come wetlands and with wetlands, come biodiversity and complexity. Uh, throughout, the his throughout, throughout history, beavers dams maintained a checkerboard of rich meadows across North America. Beavers are what we call a keystone species. For every dam uh, created by a beaver, a wetland is created providing, uh, excuse me, providing shelter and food for dozens of other species. Uh, before the arrival of the, Amer the Europeans on the American continent, it was estimated that there were about 200 million beavers in America. Uh, to put that in context, there are about 240 million humans, uh, no, sorry, adults alive in the USA today. So just for context, 200 million beavers before the Europeans arrived, 240 million adults in America today. Um, all those beavers maintained innumerable, innumerable amount of dams that led to an innumerable amount, of, innumerable amount of ecosystems across all the waterways of the country. Uh, to understand that, we have to go back to medieval times. Uh, again, just like the Big Bang Theory, this is the kind of stuff that Google search and the weird cultural, this is, this is where we are. <laughs> anyway, actual medieval times. Uh, the homes of people living in Europe during the medieval, during the Middle Ages did not have the climate control capabilities we enjoy today. And beaver fur is extremely dense, more so than many other animals, making it very warm and it's naturally waterproof because beavers are naturally waterproof. So it was sought after by royal families with reckless abandon. They stockpiled obscene amounts of beaver furs to make hats and coats. And the, uh, additionally, beaver's bodies were useful for a number of other reasons. Uh, beaver meat was once considered a delicacy. And um, back then, Christianity was central to most human affairs. So during Lent, people were banned from eating meat for 40 days. But due to their scaled tails, beavers were classified as aquatic creatures. And so they could be eaten by the nobility that could afford them. Um, beavers also, oops, uh, go back. There we go. Beavers also produce uh, an oil called castorium or castor oil which was used for medicines and perfumes, which apparently still is because this photo came from an online Etsy shop. Uh, <laughs> so there was an endless demand for dead beavers. And in the 1400s, the European beaver trade started to dry up. So by the mid 1500s, they were practically wiped out. Um, which, uh, in so when the Europeans arrived in America, they found a land of 200 million potential coats and hats. Uh, and at this time, the intercontinental fur trade began. Uh, beaver skins were seen as civilizing uh, the influence over Native Americans, introducing them to the concept of private property. By 1700, beaver populations were exterminated off of America's East Coast, and by the mid 1800s, they were practically extinct. Uh, tribes got to trade goods, traders got rich, Europeans got their beaver hats and coats, and the world lost most of nature's hydrologists. We call the beaver a keystone species because without them, all of the ecosystems that they support would go into decline as well, just like the keystone of a bridge or of an archway. Uh, over time, the ecosystems associated with the beavers built that the, the excuse me, the ecosystems associated with the with the beavers uh, environments disappeared. The decline of the beaver marks one of the first times humans altered the Earth's water cycle on a massive scale. 
but it wasn't the last. Uh, over time, we have built our own uh, sort of beaver dams for our own dam reasons. Uh, in 2003, um, this, this is the three, the three Gorges Dam in China. And in 2003, uh, the filling of this dam caused the earth to go off its axis by two centimeters. This dam is a mile and a half long and is the world's largest hydroelectric power station. Uh, so when it filled up, all this water was gathered up into one area and made this one part of the earth that much heavier. And so it sent the earth off on its axis by 0.8 of an inch. Uh, point, and that, but that added 0 0.06 microseconds to the length of the day, which is not much, but we have a leap, we have a leap day every four years because you know that time adds up. And now we've extended the day, time of the day by just this much. It's crazy to think about it. Our attempt at dominance over water has ultimately pr provided us with an illusionary sense of abundance. Um, however, though Earth is 70% water, only 2.5 of that 70% uh, is drinkable fresh water, with only 1% of that 70% of that, that is easily accessible. So we have a lot less than we think. Um, so that was an overly, overly simplified view, uh, view of a very complex topic. But I hope it's giving you some sense of how important water is and how interesting and important our relationship with it continues to be. Um, then talking about a lot of different things, a lot of sort of global topics, I'm going to scale it back to Baltimore again. Like I said, I promise everything ties back up um, to talk about how this you know weird weird water moves through the Baltimore landscape. To do that, we're going to have to go back to Baltimore in 1904. Um, Put it in the chat if you know it. What happened in Baltimore in 1904? Don't be shy. Fire. Correct. The Baltimore Fire. The Great Baltimore Fire of, of 1904 was a really, it was a really rough time for Baltimore. And remember, I mentioned earlier that. Uh, all of our pipes of, like were, were hollowed out logs. So at, at this time, all the infrastructure above ground, as you can see in, the, in this image, a lot of brick, mortar, and wood, and a lot of the infrastructure below ground are wooden pipes, everything burned because it, like the, fi the fire spread like crazy. Uh, so after this fire, Baltimore needed to redo its entire infrastructure, like I said, above ground and below ground, which led us to the new three pipe system we have today. Um, and fun fact, I'm gonna add a little addition here. Uh, the Baltimore fire also led to the standardization of the uh, American fire hydrant and fire hose because people, uh, fire departments came from other states surrounding uh, Maryland trying to help put out the fire. And when they got here, their hoses didn't fit our hydrants. Uh, but even in Baltimore, there were like several different departments that had different proprietary hoses and hydrants. So it was just, a, it was just complete chaos. And the fire would have been uh, fought a lot faster and easier if, if the standard thing had been there. So like I said, it led to the standardization, which is very cool. It also led to uh, this three pipe system, which you see here. Uh, ceramic pipes that replaced the log ones. Uh, and we installed a state of the art system at the time that separated sewage and storm water on two different pipe systems. Uh, this is a real point of pride for Baltimore. Our system was considered an engineering marvel at the time. Uh, the Baltimore Sun uh, even ran an article on it, comparing it to the sewers of Paris, which was awesome. Very metropolitan, very chic, very new back in the 1920s, which is literally a hundred years ago. Uh, these pipes that had a life expectancy of around 70 years have been in the ground being piecemeal patchworked for 30 years beyond their warranty. Uh, so that's where we stand right now. And that's why we see a lot of, that's why in the image you see a lot of cracks there. Um, to make use of gravity, when, these, uh, when this new pipe system was installed, storm drains and sewers were, were laid along the naturally occurring stream valleys because it was just easier, it was more efficient. Storm drains are des were designed to convey runoff to streams, uh, whereas sewers were designed to take sewage to treatment plants. We didn't know the long-term effects of litter, let alone micropollutants in the air and water that would be affecting our waterways. We thought, hey, it's rainwater, let's just send it out to the river. It's the same water, right? Over time, we learned that's not the case. 
Oh, forgot about that emoji. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so there are like, let me actually, I need to go back here because that emoji is important because um, these, aging, these aging pipes are now starting to share with each other because there's cracks in the sewage pipes. Our sewage can get into the storm drain pipes and flow all the way out to the harbor and vice versa. The storm, storm water that gets into the storm drain system can flow into our sewage pipes and cause sewage backups in our homes or bursts or like the next slide shows, even worse infrastructure damage. Uh, these sinkholes cost Baltimore City upwards of $70, $7 million to fix. Uh, the Public Works Department replaces about 15 miles of water mains each year to prevent the breaks in the sinkholes. Um, but when you combine the stormwater and sewage pipes, we have about 4,000 miles of crumbling pipes underground. Um, nope, stop, calm down. It's doing it again, okay. Uh, in cities, 55% of our rainwater becomes runoff versus 10% in natural environments, as you can see by this image here. Um, at the watershed level, anything above 15% impervious sur surface uh, causes significant declines in water quality, eliminating sensitive species and significantly reducing the abundance of other species. So basically, anywhere that there's hardscapes in, in abundance, like a city, uh, you're gonna have more runoff, which is gonna lead to more issues. Uh, it's the number one threat to our urban streams and the only source of water pollution that is still growing because we as humans keep expanding. Uh, if you notice on the bottom there also that image that says 10 to 10 percent shallow infiltration, 5 percent deep infiltration in, in a city. That's only the water that's really getting through the potholes and uh, cracks in the in the pavement that are themselves caused by the stormwater running over the, the, the pavement constantly. So it's just the only way that the water gets into the earth is by destroying this, the infrastructure that we put there to convey the water elsewhere. Again, uh, another another reason that it's an issue uh, is not just the volume of water, but the speed at which it travels. The, the, uh, we run faster on water. We, we add roads to ease our conveyance around the, the, the planet. Water moves on these, on these surfaces just as fast, if not faster. And uh, not only that, because of the heat island effect, boom, because of the heat island effect, the, uh, the storm, the storm water heats up and can cause uh, it can be can cause bacteria to germinate, and that ends up in our waterways as well. Um, this image here shows you the biggest culprit of urban water pollution: impervious surfaces, as I mentioned, all those gray areas. Uh, Baltimore City is around forty percent impervious surface overall. Uh, downtown is about 70 per 75 percent impervious surfaces, um, and if we pull back even further. You can see this issue isn't just uh, relegated to the cities, it's anywhere that humans have any kind of footprint. Um, anywhere that we have uh, houses, roads, sidewalks, streets, buildings, parking lots, anywhere that we have any sort of uh, hardscape to make uh, our ease of transport across the, across the earth or anything to protect us from the elements, all that generates storm water, all that storm water ends up in our waterways. Um, so it's important to know what we're up against. Uh, so this illustration depicts some of the issues that affect our urban water quality. Um, would anybody care to put some of their, uh, some of the things that they notice in the chat that are potentially uh, affecting the waterways negatively? The outfall, yeah. Uh, there are not, a lot of outfalls left in the city, but there are still some that are in operation. And basically those are uh, intentional um, release valves for, our, for the sewage system to, to intentionally dump into the waterways as a way to prevent sewage backups. Uh, yeah, plastics, lots of, um, lots of litter on the ground. Eroded riparian buffers, very nice. Yeah, somebody's, somebody knows what they're talking about here. Um, we're gonna get into those riparian buffers on in the next slide. Pet waste, yeah. Uh, that's a big one. Um, pet, wa pet waste that doesn't get picked up is one of the biggest um, contributors to pollution in uh, our waterways because people think that it's it's natural. It just it'll just like it, it's like it's like a uh, fertilizer, right? And that's true. Too much pet waste that gets into the waterways acts like fertilizer and can help cause algae blooms, which blocks off the sun and prevents the sunlight from getting to the plants and animals that need it in the water. Runoff from the parking lots. Yep. Uh, lots of bare soil washing the street from the from the uh, construction site. Yeah, uh, there's a, you'll, 
a lot of suspended solids that end up in the harbor come from um, construction sites that are not doing proper practices. So if you're out in your travels and you happen to see a construction site that doesn't have um, a barrier up of some kind, uh, make sure you call 311 about it. Now let's see what else we got here. Uh, illegal dumping in landfills. Yeah, the illegal dumping is a big one. Um, because yeah, like a, storm, a rainstorm isn't gonna carry a whole TV down to a storm drain the way it would a chip bag, right? But what it is gonna do, it's gonna start to break down that TV and it's all of its metal and glass components and plastics and things like that bit by bit that those are gonna wash their way slowly into the water. Same thing with like a couch or a bed, anything that gets dumped. Um, so yeah, all those little metals and, and plastics and things like that. Leakage, say, uh, when you say leakage, what do you, uh, you mean from the car? Somebody washing, that's somebody washing their car and then not doing it over the, uh, not doing it over a, a permeable surface. Leakage from the pipes. Uh, not sure what you mean, but the, uh, the water, the water that's coming out is supposed to be storm water from that main pipe there in the middle. But I'll just point out, what, what do we got here? We got one more message. What's on the roof of the garage? Uh, yeah, well, that's, that is puddled up water that is staying stagnant because uh, the roof is probably not, not, probably not properly pitched. Uh, but you can see the streak coming out of the downspouts where that's air, that's air pollution. If you look on downspouts in, you know, in real life and you see those little black streaks on the side of it, that is particulates that have made their way into the water that gathered up and, and finally clung to something. There's plenty more in the water that washed down, but that's the stuff that finally managed to stick. Pesticides and contaminants from the lawnmower, yep, not being properly taken care of, and that's all washing down there. Uh, let's see. Talk about landfill, uh, say something about landfills. Uh, they're, uh, they're a necessary -ish problem at the, <laughs> at the moment because we need, we need somewhere to put our garbage and that's, this, that's what we have right now. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next slide where we can, come on, here we go. All right, so this shows you what happens during a rainstorm in uncared for and poorly designed uh, urban environment. Um, are there any uh, Stephen King fans out there maybe? Well, we'll get to more on that later. Um, for now, let's talk a little bit more about why runoff is an issue. So at, besides all the things that we saw in that slide, the biggest issues with stormwater is that water enters the stream at a high, by the quality and quantity. Uh, the quantity, as it, enter, it causes the, a huge amount of erosion separating our uh, local fauna from their food and water sources. Um, as you can see, that's a really unnatural uh, uh, embankment there. And then, the, like I said, the quality, water carries pollutants such as pesticides, fertilizers, oil, trash, sediment, and bacteria. And in high temperatures, all that stuff just gets generated more and more. And, the, and our system is designed to carry it just somewhere else and dump it out. Um, yeah, this slide is very uncooperative in terms of the animations, uh, but I'll do my best here. This slide shows the impacts that the runoff has on the quality of water and urban streams. Uh, these are just quickly going through the other things that can affect the water. Like I said, the animation doesn't always cooperate, but I'll try to keep up with it. Fecal coliform bacteria is a nice way of saying poop. Heavy metals and not the fun kind come from, uh, no, see, this is, yeah. I'm sorry about this, everybody. This slide, um, the, I've, okay, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just read through it now. Um, fecal coliform bacteria is a fancy way of saying poop. Uh, again, I mentioned pet waste that doesn't get properly picked up um, and wildlife waste because, you know, in, 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 in the natural world, deer don't have to run through city streets in order to get from one part of their territory to another. So when they poop and it ends up on the sidewalk, that ends up down in the storm drains. Heavy metals, uh, not the fun kind. These are things from um, industries that have been allowed to do a certain amount of dumping or from just air pollution from our vehicles and stormwater runoff that moves both those things around. Uh, all those microparticulates eventually settle on the bottom of our waterways and gather together just like those black streaks on the sides of um, uh, storm drains or uh, gutters and things like that. Legacy pollutants, these are where most of these heavy metals are coming from. These are uh, big polluters that were polluting since before certain regulations were in place or have a certain amount of leeway and are allowed to do a certain amount of dumping. Um, and so that uh, the areas around those places generally have a lot of that stuff on the bottom. 
Uh, and then total suspended solids, that's when that stuff gets picked up. Or as we mentioned, if there's a construction site where uh, they don't properly block off the, the um, sediment from running off and that ends up in our waterways. And just like an algae bloom, uh, the dust and suspended solids and things like that get kicked up can block sunlight from the bottom of the ocean or the waterway uh, and from, and from the, uh, the plants and animal life that need, that need sunlight to live. And nutrients, uh, that's just another fancy way of saying poop. That's how we refer to it when we're talking about fertilizers, whether that's on an agriculture scale or a homeowner scale, uh, it all contributes, even if it's only a little bit. All right, Whew. that was a lot. I'm sorry again about that slide. I don't know why those animations never work right. All right, so most, um, most trash in Baltimore Harbor Water, which, uh, which is equivalent to 19 elephants. Um, I don't have the latest stats on what he's collected since last year, but I should look that up. Um, if you are out and about and you see this kind of uh, this kind of thing here, this is this is the kind of thing you would need to report to 311. Not because of the trash up in the trees, uh, but because of that milky stuff in the water. That is sewage. Oh my God, I am this slide. This slide is driving me crazy. Uh, that is that is sewage. Uh, the only way we know it's sewage is because of that milky color, which is basically dissolved toilet paper. Um, so what that means is that there's a sewage pipe leaking nearby, making its way into the waterway. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you would want to report to 311. Um, there's been a lot of construction on, on the Fallsway for 83 lately because they had, there have been a lot of issues with the storm drains and sewage pipes down there. Um, and a lot of that is because of people were calling 311 over and over and over again about how bad it was. So squeaky wheel gets the grease. It needs a lot. You need a lot of uh, like a, the more the, the more people, the more people draw attention to an issue, the more likely it is to get dealt with. Um, so, yeah. So if you see any gray water like this, that means it's sewage leak. Please report it um, to uh, this, this number here. This is our pollution reporting number. You can also call 311. Uh, if you see something like this, you should definitely report that to 311. Um, and this is a lot, this is a lot, and it's a lot, it's mostly bad news, so, but have no fear, Blue Water is trying to do something about it. Uh, Baltimore is an ecosystem, albeit an odd, seeming unnatural one, because it's a city, uh, but to understand the problems, we have to understand the systems that govern our ecosystem. We have to understand that everything is connected, which we discussed earlier. Uh, so this is an image that after a lot of teamwork and public policy and public advocacy uh, could lead to a lot of good practices. And I'm just gonna click through them. Um, some, some, of the, some of the ones that you, you all mentioned already. Um, picking up, picking up uh, after the dog, we've got some construction fencing up at the top here to block any sediment runoff. Uh, there's been a green roof planted on this rooftop here so that there wouldn't be any, any of the air pollutants that would make it through. We're gonna get um, absorbed and neutralized in those plants roots. Uh, a lot of permeable pavers around. There's a driveway where the person was washing their car. Now they moved onto the grass, also a viable option. Uh, car must have been pretty dirty because in the last slide it was yellow. I mean, it was blue, now it's yellow. Um, there's also somebody finally picking up all that trash and the person doing the little projects in their backyard have some um, absorbent materials to uh, take care of their oil and things like that and some permeable pavers again to help prevent it from running off directly into the street. Uh, these pavers here on the sidewalk next to the person picking up after her dog, this is more what you would put in a, a, a private walkway, not on a public sidewalk like this. The illustrator just put that in there as an example. But this is a, this is a good thing that you could think about doing on your own home. Uh, adding in those pavers and plants will absorb storm water um, and, the, and the water will go off the pavers to that gravel there and it'll percolate down to the ground slowly versus just running off of a uh, concrete slab of, of sidewalk. We have people replanting the trees along the embankment to help uh, fight the erosion and putting in some of the uh, these uh, stone, um, oh gosh, what did, you, what did you call them earlier? Uh, oh no, <laughs> I hit escape. Uh, these, these stone uh, things along the, the riverbank to help prevent erosion. And we have some of these little jetties here on the bottom that'll add a little bit of easement to the water, make it, rather than the water moving at a straight shot, It'll move more in a serpentine way through these jetties so that it's not moving quite as quickly and not doing as much erosion. 
Uh, we've got a cleanup. We've got people riding bikes and driving electric cars, and we've got some storm drain stenciling. It's another thing Blue Water does. So these are all different things that are completely within uh, your, your, your grasp and uh, things that we at Blue Water here do as well. Um, let's see. But at Blue Water Baltimore, we are trying to fuse eco literacy and sustainability education into our work. Uh, eco literacy is a term that is used to denote the understanding of the principles that govern the health of the Earth and its ecosystem. So to be eco literate means that you use this understanding to promote sustainable human communities. Uh, sustainable systems rely on the balance and health of these three systems: uh, uh, environment, economy, and equity. And so we at Blue Water are trying to take that into um, every consideration with everything we do. Um, oh, come on. I mentioned that we are the Baltimore Harbor Waterkeeper Organization. Uh, our Harbor Keeper program focuses on utilizing uh, science and the law to achieve cleaner water for Baltimore um, through field work and citizen action. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Waterkeepers, they're a great organization. Um, uh, they're part of an, they're an international organization. Uh, there are, are water keepers all over the planet. Um, anywhere there is a, any, any city that has a body of water has a harbor keeper organization. Um, our harbor keeper goes out weekly to collect samples from the harbor and its various tributaries in order to collect data, which gets uploaded to our Baltimore Water Watch webpage. Uh, you can go to howsthewaterhun.org or baltimorewaterwatch.org, either one. Uh, and we don't do, we normally have citizens helping us out with the collecting of that data, but due to the pandemic, we have instead relied on other staff members helping out. For example, I'm gonna be going out with the team in the beginning of February to uh, take some samples, but keep an eye on our website because Knockwood, we re really like to bring uh, people back on the boat to do sampling. So hopefully this year, now that people are getting vaxxed and boosted. Um, in partnership with a few other organizations, uh, Blue Water has put out a report card every year that shares the data that we collected over the years. Um, this is the one from 2019. The 2020 uh, issue was digital and the 2021 has not yet come out yet, uh, but it will, it will be available online at some point soon. Um, it takes a couple of months to, to kind of crunch the data and get everything laid out. Um, and let's see, what else does Blue Water do? We also, Help get green infrastructure in the ground. Uh, these are some bump outs in Butcher's Hill that would ca that catch and redirect storm water that would otherwise go down to the storm drain is now being used to water these uh, various um, local native plants. Uh, the goal of green infrastructure is to try to mimic the water cycle of a healthy ecosystem as much as possible in a city. Uh, here's another rain garden and bioretention we did at a church over on, uh, what was that, the east side? I believe that's the, I believe Maze Grace is on the east side. Um, no, west side, I'm sorry. Uh, we also do a lot of, of tree planting. Um, we do tree planting both in open area fields that need, re, that need to be reforested, like parks that have had the tree line reduced, uh, or schools, places of worship that have big campuses and would like to fill it in. Uh, but as you can see, we also do a fair amount of, of hardscape removal and uh, tree planting on these, uh, heart, like in these areas, we will pull out chunks of sidewalk and put in a tree that will, uh, that will then grow in that spot. Uh, a single mature tree can absorb up to 50 to 100 gallons of rain during a large storm, along with all the pollutants that come with it. So a street tree is gonna catch all, this, all the water that runs down the sidewalk and get about 50 to 100 gallons of it per storm, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, so that's all the stuff that we do. Uh, what you might be asking yourself what you can do. I'm very glad you asked. Um, I have mainly been talking about uh, urban run, oh my gosh. I've mainly been talking about urban runoff and infrastructure issues, but conservation is also important. Uh, this graph here is based off of UN statistics. Uh, so you can see uh, domestically, we're not having the biggest impact here. On a personal level, you should do all you could, you can, or you, all, everything you can to conserve water, uh, but the fight is, much bigger than what you do on a personal scale when it comes to conservation. Uh, it's important to keep water on the forefront of your mind through conservation, but it's not, that's not enough. If taking a shower for a, a shorter amount of time 
is untenable to you and make you a miserable person, uh, maybe consider your dietary choices, um, where your food is coming from and how far away uh, the packaging it comes up. Purchasing is power and uh, to help drive down the use of fresh drinkable water in agriculture and industry, you can vote with your money. Uh, you, may, you probably know that bottled water more often than not is just heavily branded tap water, even if it does come from Fiji. Uh, and if it's a private commodity that's being sold, it's not regulated nearly as much as tap water. So that's something to consider also. The water you get in a bottle, not nearly as regulated as the stuff that comes out of the tap. So if you like to get your hands dirty, we do have opportunities for you. Uh, we have no shortages uh, of opportunities to engage in tree plantings and maintenance. Um, you can talk to me afterwards about that, but the easiest way is just go to, the, go to our website and see what's coming up. Things are a little odd in COVID times. Like we're not doing any indoor activities right now. We're doing all strictly outdoor stuff. Um, in the winter, we'll be doing a lot of tree maintenance in the spring, a lot of tree planting. Uh, we also have other opportunities <laughs> for um, yeah, so more edu just... educational workshops, uh, which we, uh, <laughs> uh, again, these are all gonna be digital um, and not indoors because of, um, because of COVID. We might do some outdoors uh, in person. Again, it'll depend, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, but again, you can, you can check out our website for all the different um, uh, workshop opportunities we offer. Um, and then there's stuff you can do uh, on a smaller scale at your own home, you can start harvesting the rainwater that falls on your property by installing a rain barrel um, or redirecting the downspout to, directly to your garden if you have one. Um, these are these can be done on a private home as, as well as scaled up with cisterns on large buildings. Some people, definitely something to consider. You can plant rain gardens. Uh, this is another, another, um, another great way to help divert and reuse stormwater that, that would otherwise Go down to our drains and out to the harbor. You can take them and use them to plant to plant and water a native garden, which will then in turn help uh, promote bees and other pollinators. Um, if you're interested in something like that, uh, I you consider talking to the Baltimore City Master Gardeners, looking at their program, or talking to our folks in our nursery. We have a native nursery that um, we are starting to um, propagate our own plants there as well. Mostly, we're buying from uh, organic and, and native. Um, growers and, and selling them at our nursery. But we, like I said, we are starting to grow our own seed as well, which is very cool. Uh, so, and you can volunteer there as well, um, not, not just, not just by, uh, <laughs> by plants. Um, this is an update and I need to update the slide. I'm sorry about that. There are not as many um, rallies against the sewage at the moment, but the sewage backup issue is ongoing. If you know of anybody that has issues with sewage backups, you, know, you can talk to me afterwards. Um, we'd like to get testimony from them if possible. Uh, and there's lots of different other ways that you can help on a small scale um, in, your own, in your own way um, to help keep the waterways clean just through simple changes in your, uh, in your behavior. And help spread the word. You know, every, anything you've learned today, especially the fact that the sewage line and the storm drain line are two different uh, pipe systems, please share that fact with people because uh, not, not a lot of folks know that. Um, you know, and also uh, educating folks about what you should and should should not put down your drain. Um, a big ax of mine to grind is that there's nothing that's flushable other than toilet paper and what comes out of us. That includes flushable wipes. They're not actually flushable. I, I dare you the next time you go to the supermarket, get, look, at a, look at a package of flushable wipes, turn it around until you find the small print that says, uh, that qualifies it saying it's only flushable if your jurisdiction or your area like has a system that can't actually deal with flushable wipes. Other than that, they are just leading to things like the Baltimore Fatberg. If you don't know what the Fatberg is, you should Google it. It's gross. Uh, but basically, they could write flushable on a box of pencils as long as they put small print on the on the back that says not actually flushable. Um, so if and if you don't feel like doing any of that, uh, I'll, uh, sorry, definitely make sure you let people know if they see anything like that in the sewers. Uh, and if you find any of any of that untenable, we'll always take donations of money. If, if not time. So we finally come to the end of it. Uh, that's my supervisor's um, email address at the bottom there. Don't listen to that. That's, um, I'll put my email in the chat and I will stop sharing my screen. And let's open up the Q&A if anybody has any questions right now. Thank you, John. That was fabulous. Um, Thank you for bearing with me, everybody. 
Sorry, let me put a spot. I've got a spotlight you. Yeah. All right. Any questions for John? June? You have a question. Go ahead, unmute. Yeah, um, I have a question because I actually found a sewage leak in a river today, and I don't know a number in my area to call. Where are you currently? In Asheville, North Carolina. Um, okay. Uh, well. Or how we would go about like finding that number. I, I don't know what to Google. So do you? Um, okay. Do you have uh, like a three one one? Asheville, Asheville should have like a three one one system. Um, that I would okay. start there. I would start call okay. call three one one or or yeah, googling um, looking up the Asheville three one one. And if you can get as close the address of the mm -hmm. leak as possible, just you know make it make it as a script as possible and like. Do that a couple of times. Call call at least once a day for a while until it gets taken care of. Um, also, I would look and see if if you look try to find your local uh, waterkeeper organization and let them know. Okay, um, it is it's on a college campus, um, so I've already contacted like the the person there who's in charge of the land. So, okay. but that's that might make it tricky then with three one one if it's not in a public space. That would be something that the college is going to have to deal with next to the public. Um, is it is it is well, this a public area? Uh, it's next to a, a trail that's open to the public, but it's owned by the college, so it's technically private land. So that's yeah, tricky. So yeah. I mean, continue <laughs> talking to the the college. <laughs> yeah, squeaky squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's usually how it goes. Thank you. Appreciated this. It's it's great. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, let me see. We have. Um, E says, what about trash on the highways? Is this related to sewage at all and or storm water? If they've noticed an increase on Baltimore highways. Um, I have noticed an increase as well. Um, part of that, I think, so I noticed an increase last, uh, last year and two years. And I think part of that was due to um, the uh, issues with, with trash services during the pandemic. Um, and I imagine some of this is still related to that. We're, we're, we're getting um, recycling delays around the city. Uh, I also, I imagine there's a fair amount of um, just general frustration with the world. And there's, cause there's a lot, so there's a lot of people who just don't care. The less you interact with a place, the less you care about it. So for the last few years, we've been locked inside. So outdoors might not be, mean as much to people. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, it could be really, it could be like have got carried there from either a, a rainstorm or from wind. Usually when you see large amounts of litter that they weren't all dumped there intentionally, it's all like blown there and gathered up. Um, it's hard to say. I will say uh, the, there was a study done in Australia um, about 10 years ago where they talked to litterers, right? Like there was people out on the streets in Australia right, and right after the fact they would go up to them and interview them. And the number one reason people gave for littering was they didn't like being told what to do. So. That's odd, okay. Um, Jan, you have your hand up, go ahead. Oh, uh, back to landfills. Sure. Uh, we're running out of them. Yeah, yes. Um, uh, some of the transfer stations accept uh construction equipment and and leftovers and they also accept electronics i hate to bring that subject up how the are the electronic uh discards being properly recycled uh i also wanted to ask about cemeteries with all those enormous lawns um, yeah, cemeteries. Green burials are becoming popular. Somebody mentioned in the comments uh, in the chat about water cremation, which sort of worries me. I don't know how water cremation exactly works. I have to look into that. Um, so cemeteries, landfills, uh, and oh, lawns, can we please have a large public campaign to educate people about getting rid of their lawns and the developers who create newly developed communities 
with nothing but lollipop trees and lawns? Can we educate them about planting native plants instead? I would love to. I know that a lot of um, new construction projects have to have a certain amount of green infrastructure built in, and some of that is uh, trees and plants. I don't know um, how strict they are with native species. I know with the projects that we're involved with at Blue Water, uh, we always we always uh, push for native species and push for uh, reducing the amount of um, like we we never we never install lawn, we never install sod, uh, but it's it culturally it's what people like in America, unfortunately. Uh, if you, if it, encourage everyone to look up um, the, I mean, you can find all sorts of information about why lawns are bad, but um, if you want kind of a nice little primer, there's a podcast called The Anthropocene, reviewed uh, by the author John Green, who wrote uh, Everything is Illuminated. And um, he, he, basically it's a, it's a tongue in cheek uh, series where he reviews things of the of our world on a five-star scale um and one of the things he reviews is kentucky bluegrass and he gives it like half a star or something like that and he gets into how you know every, everything that you're saying it's it's the largest crop we grow in america is kentucky bluegrass it's not edible it requires gallons upon gallons of water to maintain while we don't eat it and it, it, re it requires like gallons and gallons of fossil fuels to maintain when we don't eat it this it's it is it is a it is pure waste <laughs> like a, a, a lawn a lawn is pure waste so again the anthropocene reviewed uh by john green the uh the kentucky bluegrass episode um if you don't if you if you if you don't know why lawns are terrible that's a great place to start <laughs> lawns are yawns i like that i like that one a lot um and green burial the, the green burial thing is interesting i had not heard about uh water water cremation um i do know that there's a lot of strict rules about being buried near trees and plants and things like that because of groundwater laws um i so i know that's why one of there's a popular option now of being cremated and mixed in with the uh the soil and fertilizer of a, of a new tree um but that's the closest i've heard of like a, a, a green burial so to speak all right kathleen you have a question go ahead Hi, you wear yes. oh, sorry. Hold on, I think I have a another. Did, did you just put your question in the chat, Kathleen? Yeah, I did. Uh I am I am not uh familiar with this. Well, I can send you a lot more information. The um there's a lot of groups that are uh, involved in trying to um stop the paving of green space um, in schools and parks, but basically with plastic. I mean, there's, there's literally in Maryland, the Sierra Club um, Zero Waste Committee just did a Maryland-wide uh, inventory as the best they could. Um, and there's literally thousands and thousands of acres of formerly real green space covered with green plastic and rocks. So they take all the soil away oh, and um, put, put in rocks and cover it with plastic carpets. Um, oh, which are only why? last years <laughs> before they have to be landfilled. And you're lucky if they get landfilled because what they do a lot of times is just dump them. Um, uh, one of our local schools, their uh, synthetic turf field got dumped on, um, next to Bird Creek in Baltimore County. They trucked it up there and uh, dumped it on a, a paintball field, most of and with the tire crumb um, washing off into the, uh, the stream. So anyway, it's a huge problem and most that most adults aren't aware of because they don't play on the stuff. And it gets no, hotter than I, asphalt for the kids. Now, now that I remember, I, I remember from like when I was a kid, um, this is going to date me uh, more than more than my beard will. Uh, I remember that when they made the switch from wooden playground equipment to the like the metal, like the more metal and plastic stuff and like that, that specifically that really dense uh, plastic. And I, yeah, and I remember it like, it was always, yeah, it was hot, <laughs> burn my legs. Um, I, I've, as far as like the, like covering of the plastic and making that show, I've never heard of that. That's, that's all news to me. And, but I, I, I will say uh, for a bit of like good news, there's been a big push for um, these sort, like sort of the exact opposite of that green, these green play spaces, natural play spaces uh, that have 
basically big fall, like fallen trees and a, a blanket of mulch from that fell tree. Over in Druid Hill Park, there's a really big one because uh, it's right where forestry operates. So they have the ability to make a nice one. And the idea is that it is, it's a, there's no jungle gym equipment. There's, um, there's just pieces of, of tree and, and, and things like that, that the kids can crawl on and they're not going to fall from a great height. They're not going to land on metal. It's like they're going to land on a, on a piece of wood. And slowly this thing will break down over time and then get re- and then be you know soft and fall apart and then they'll replace it with another tree. Uh, right. So that's there's stuff like that is great. Um, yeah, that's what we're that's what we want to see. Um, and but that's not what the industry. It, it these things are cash cows for the industry and the tire the tire um, waste and tire recycling industry are pushing. Oh yeah, the, um, I, rubber place. rubber mulch, rubber rubber mulch is the worst. Yeah, and it's full oh. of toxins. It's full of lead, yeah. um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and there's a chemical recently that was found in tire um, leaching out from tires that kills all of the salmon runs in the Northwest, and it, it's probably uh, affecting all of our fish and all of our waterways. So, uh, and there was a congressional hearing on it. It's a, it's a very new um, finding, and I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you. The Sierra Maryland Sierra Club is really um, on top of this now. I just read the I just read the uh, El- LVS comment about um, the synthetic turf getting shredded and breathing breathing in little particulates of it as sure. as you're playing it. That's madness. Kind of like pig pen. Think of pig pen with the cloud of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what it's like. So you, instead of breathing in soil, you're breathing in tire wear particles and plastic, microplastic particles and dust. Yep. <sighs> There's a lot uh, of. Uh... <laughs> Uh, any other questions for John this evening as we're wrapping up? I don't see any, but there. Um, I want to. I want to thank John for coming and sharing this wonderful presentation. Um, I want to thank Baltimore uh, Blue Water Baltimore for the amazing work that they're doing um, on a variety of fronts to make our um, water swimmable and drinkable and fishable, which is what the Clean Water Act uh, says that we should need. And I think that's a good, a good thing to have, swimmable, fishable, and drinkable water. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening to not only learn, but also take this knowledge and share it with others. And I have to say that uh, we are a very educated group that comes together on, on Thursdays and um, we learn from each other. So I know that uh, John appreciates uh, learning more about other issues that he might not have known about. And we- I just learned a bunch in the last five minutes. Yeah, we can all work together um, to be part of that big solution. Um, so again, thank you all. Uh, I hope that you will, will join us next Thursday. Um, it is Downy Mildew, and I'm excited to learn more about that. Uh, and uh, stay safe, stay curious, and stay well, everybody. And we hope to see you very soon. Take care. Thank you all so much.